So here we are with the final episode of season four, technically. The reason I say that is because this episode wasn't actually, well, oh, let's back up further. If you saw the recently re-released Babylon 5 videos, you know about the birth and struggles of the show on PTEN, which despite being primetime entertainment network, wasn't actually a network, but rather a fusion between an experienced maker of television entertainment and a company that manufactures fiberglass. What is amazing is not that it shut down four years later, but rather that such a bizarre idea managed to last even that long. Because Babylon 5 was on PTEN, the future of the show, with its intended five-year run, was in jeopardy. Consequently, the last episode of 4 was made to serve as a series finale. Now, fortunately, or not if you hate Season 5 as much as some do, B5 was given new life on TNT, with the previously discussed reworking of The Gathering, the also previously discussed In the Beginning, and two other films, Third Space and River of Souls, plus the promised fifth season. For that reason, the series finale was delayed to be, well, the series finale. And this episode was quickly conceived to instead close out season four. Technically, this is actually the first episode of season five, at least as far as this production went. But for all intents and purposes, yeah, this is the end of season four. So we kick off with Sheridan and Delenn arriving on Babylon 5 to much celebration, which they get in spite of wanting a quiet return. This surprises Londo, too. Among my people, this is how we celebrate state funerals. Having seen your last emperor, I can completely understand that. But Sheridan and Delenn are both bothered that they have become the symbols of victory when this was only achieved because everyone came together. In a hundred years, it won't matter who we were. They probably won't even remember. Doodly, doodly, doodly. Continuity error caused by high energy. Correcting for error. Resetting. Do you wish to continue? Oh, wow. Of all things about B5 to say it was the 90s, this has got to be king of the mountain. This is the you in your hammer pants doing the Macarena footage. After the title, some weeks have passed and ISN is having a late night news program about it. See, back in 1980 during the Iran hostage crisis, there was a series of nightly broadcasts about it with respected TV journalist Ted Koppel hosting. And it was so successful that it became Nightline the model of the late-night news program. In our era, where multiple 24-hour news channels exist, plus the news coverage on the web, they've changed to a degree. But at this time, this was where serious discussions on current events were investigated, hashed out by a panel, and often presented in a way to help people digest the nuances of complex events. JMS is giving what was recognizable at the time as the key way most people would likely hear more about something as complex as the actions of John Sheridan and his new role as president of the Interstellar Alliance. The panel that is brought in, a senator, an author, journalist, and a political commentator and former speechwriter within the Clark administration, all are there to comment on things, and this was typical as well. Politicians naturally wanted to be seen commenting on the events of the day, so we're eager to get on Nightline and similar shows. Senator Biden, what was your impression of the, the combat readiness of those units? Well, I was very impressed, Mr. Koppel. Uh, not only was I impressed with the physical force, but the attitude and the morale of both the ship's officers and the men. And even non-journalist authors were regular guests on such programs. The one that most springs to my mind was... Um, an incident when Isaac Asimov was brought on board while they were discussing SDI, or Star Wars. What stuck out was his utilizing part of the very creation of the show itself. They were having trouble trying to get the broadcast system to work properly from the different locations that were taking place. And he made that part of his point on SDI. If a seasoned news program on a major network couldn't properly set up remote communications on the first try, could you really entrust protection from nuclear weapons to technology that wasn't even really theoretical yet? As for the third one, a political commentator, obviously that would be a staple of such programs. For the guy specifically being from the Clark regime, well, that might surprise you, but remember that JMS developed this in the years after the fall of the Soviet Union, so knew from precedent what might happen with an authoritarian regime collapsing. Imprisoned journalists, for instance, were freed and immediately went right back to reporting. 
while those inside the system would just transition into the new power structure one way or another. It doesn't always happen that way, obviously, but in this particular case, it seemed pretty fitting. I get into all of this because me discussing their debate won't really accomplish anything. They debate the merit of Sheridan's actions, and it's an interesting way of looking at it from numerous angles, both legitimately and how it may look when seen through the eyes of one's political enemies. All this is going to come up a little bit later. The next sequence is set 100 years later. Remember Sheridan's remark about how no one would likely even remember them in 100 years? It's an educational discussion on it with a history professor leading a panel that has a political scientist and a psychologist to look back on Sheridan. But the individual really cannot affect change as an act of will. They did not do. They allowed others to do. Well, the panel is very much of the opinion that Sheridan's reputation is PR, if not outright propaganda. The psychologist said that as individuals, they did nothing. They were merely symbols people could focus their hopes on for change. The political scientist is convinced that not only did things Sheridan has been claimed to have done weren't because of him, but also that his actions led to the telepath war. In other words, Sheridan gets no credit for things that go right, and much of the blame when things go wrong. There's a clip of Garibaldi where he was being held hostage during the telepath crisis, which appears to end with him getting gunned down in cold blood. So there's something we'll have to watch for in Season 5. What they seem to really be building on is twofold. First is the classic debate of great man versus the forces of history. The political scientist really, really leans into the forces of history thing. Well, JMS is demonstrating the reason why historians have generally moved into a third category, the synthesis idea. Existing socio-political and economic forces are a constraint on the forces that individuals can bring to bear, yes, but there is a capacity for people in the right position to have the influence that alters the course of history. Put simply, history is often not narratively convenient. There are numerous factors that can come into play and alter events. For example, in the 1988 presidential race, Michael Dukakis infamously appeared in a media event riding in a tank. It's universally agreed that this succeeded only in making Dukakis look like a complete jackass. It became conventional wisdom that this in fact cost him the election, was the reason we had a Bush presidency instead, and thus because the president lost on account of the massive economic downturn that took place in 1992, it paved the way for Bill Clinton's 1992 victory that made his family a major force in U.S. politics for decades. Yet, Dukakis' screw-up was probably not the sole reason for his defeat, except the narrative of that is so appealing that people would like to think that anyway. If he hadn't just worn that stupid helmet, he might have completely altered the course of history. In reverse, George Washington was a major player in the American Revolution, but it would have happened with or without him. It was the culmination of numerous forces. And it's not unreasonable to think that without his leadership, there would have been victory anyway. Some other general would have done it. Yet it also is recognized that Washington's views and values heavily influenced his role in American politics, and as the first president set the precedence for the office, heavily influenced the direction of the country from then on. Had someone else served that role, set the precedence, things could have resulted in a country very, very different than the one we have today. The right people in the right place at the right time is the idea JMS seems to convey. Lesser individuals than Sheridan and Delenn could have been unable to rally the forces of light to defeat the shadows and end Clark's fascist regime, never mind forge the interstellar alliance. They couldn't have done it alone, no, but it likely wouldn't have happened had others been there in their place. The second is a reactionary view of reevaluating history that swings the pendulum far in the other direction. In this case, Sheridan not only wasn't a great man who was at the center of a transformation that created a century of peace, no, no. His success was more in spite of his actions than because of them. The Alliance has a vested interest in mythologizing a, quote, megalomaniac and in perpetuating the idea that Delenn is still alive, even at the age of 140.
and she doesn't look a day over 128. They recognize her. She was very likely the only human Minbari hybrid, after all. But all she came to say was that Sheridan was a kind and good man. When the political scientist now is eager to discuss things firsthand, Delenn dismisses her. As she doesn't want to learn anything, she just wants to say what she thinks and ignore what contradicts it. <laughs> sure would hate to be exposed to people like that. The next footage comes 400 years after that, where a man with a stylized SS badge is working on a holographic recreation of Babylon 5. I feel to see how this could end badly. The purpose of this simulation is to provide reverse correct info speak as support for current changes in Earth policy. Oh, sweet baby Orwell, here we go again. In order to support opposition to the interstellar alliance among the peoples of Earth, they're going to recast the historical figures in ways that are more historically convenient, like if they were all assholes. They've made holographic recreations of the key players of that time, and now they're downloading their historical knowledge into them, thus allowing them to think like the people that they were based on. Then, to demonstrate flexibility and capacity to react realistically, he gives them the past 500 years of history to note how they react. Not propaganda. Good facts. As opposed to real facts. Good facts. The truthiness before truthiness. The current fascists in charge want to break with the Alliance to allow for a new era of Earth expansionism. So they're going to use these four to create false histories to justify a break from the Alliance by showing it was created by, well, dickheads. In the historical information, the recreations also learn of the current political situation, that there's a division in EarthGov that has them on the cusp of a civil war. Your legacy has proven a hindrance to that intention. Therefore, you must be deconstructed. Note the use of the word deconstructed, which is used repeatedly by this guy, and its relation to the title. That's what this has been, a deconstruction of the characters and events in every single time period that we've been seeing, trying to twist them to fit personal agendas. Whether it was the political events of the time right afterwards, the historical reputations of scholars a hundred years later, or the machinations of authoritarian oppressors half a millennia later. Sheridan then gives a bloodthirsty speech about conquest and the subversion they'll do to expand, until he orders the execution of those who surrendered, hoping for mercy. To top that, Franklin then gives a log entry about his medical experiments in the field of applied evil. All of this, of course, is in the name of the Alliance's plan to create a compliant, docile population. He's doing this to children because of course he is. There are no puppies and kittens available on this station. Garibaldi is the only one who's still autonomous right now and decides it's time for fast-talking. And here's hoping it goes better than it was during his time as a hostage. He says that he was Sheridan's tactical brains during the war, and before he's wiped away, he could be of use. And that use could help this guy get in good with the new overlords. It seems pretty obvious to him that they're plotting a preemptive strike. So Garibaldi persuades him of all the advantages of getting his input, so the guy admits to the rapidly approaching attack deadline, why he's rushing to get this job finished first. They'll be aiming for civilian targets to demoralize the enemy, and because it's more fun to attack people who can't shoot back. Well, Garibaldi, even as a recreation, had a knack for tech systems, so as information was being downloaded into him, he noted the details of the process, allowing him to understand, essentially, how to reach out in the other direction and so used their own system to broadcast the conversation they just had to their enemies. And yeah, their nukes are coming this way now. So I'm afraid that the boot stomping on a human face forever just got a nail shoved through it. 500 years after that, or 1,000 years after the events of Babylon 5, there's a recording in a monastery where Roy Brocksmith, the wonderful character actor who sadly died before his time, plays Brother Alwyn tending to the crisis of faith of Brother Michael, who is played by a guy whose most notable IMDb mentions, besides voice work, is appearing in the David Hasselhoff Nick Fury TV movie. It's often presumed that this part of the episode is based upon the classic A Canticle for Leibowitz, 
where a monastic order is founded to preserve knowledge in the face of a population that values ignorance after nuclear war devastates the planet. Well, JMS insists, though, that while he later realized this was where he wound up going, he got here via a different mental route, and that B-5 already made use of monks anyway, and that it was logical that after devastation, an organization like the Catholic Church would have a good chance of surviving and consequently have the resources that the rangers could make use of, so went ahead with it anyway. The gist is that Michael is not sure he can believe what their order believes anymore. All the stuff in this book, there's no actual proof that it happened. Although you might say proof is kind of hard to find after you burn the planet to ashes. But they come tomorrow. Is your life a lie then? I cannot help you, Brother Michael. That is what faith is for. Brother Alwyn's point is that neither reason nor faith is the start and the end, because faith gives hope when reason says things are hopeless. That doesn't have to be religious or supernatural. It can be psychological faith, too. Sometimes the difference between victory or defeat in any endeavor is people being willing to believe in it despite reason saying that it can't be done. If things go wrong and you're left merely surviving day to day, no end in sight that anything other than simple survival until one day, well, you fail to survive, well, it's going to be a lot hard to keep going. Whereas faith that there will be a change or chance for you to make a change for the better will sustain more than the belief that all you're going to do is die. Brother Alwyn makes the point that if the Rangers returned as promised, they couldn't simply drop on the planet and start handing out iPhones. They would need to come in secret to prepare the population to be ready. That, in fact, is what Brother Alwyn is secretly doing as a ranger, devoting his life to helping to slowly restore the world. That's the kind of work that takes faith, too, that it will all be worth the sacrifice of living your entire life in a primitive hamlet, hoping the locals won't burn you at the stake for inventing the bicycle. Well, all these records are being watched by a bald guy one million years after the events of Babylon 5 in order to bring the complete story back to New Earth as the sun is about to go supernova. That ties all the way back to Infection, Season 1, when St. Clair made the point that without looking outward, all that mankind has ever built will end when a supernova destroys the world. Now they leave the cradle behind and... We seem to have had an upgrade. And JMS has one final message, tying back to the earlier point that reason alone isn't enough to sustain us. Dedicated to all the people who predicted that the Babylon Project would fail in its mission, faith manages. I realize this was a lot of me talking around the episode's events, but that's only because this episode, oh, which, by the way, I give a stamp of strongly recommended. They've been so serialized you couldn't really miss one for a long, long time. This episode is intended to make you think, consider, and discuss. The specificity of the episode is there in service to that, hence me sharing my thoughts is doing what the episode wants me to, at least that's the way I think. A fine end to the season and a way to thumb one's nose at one's critics in a way that's actually positive. That to listen to those who promise only failure makes failure a certainty, while defying them opens up the hope for success, and hope can create possibilities.